I'm here because we need to redefine what it means to be a badass. I'm here because we need to give people permission to feel. More specifically, we need to give men permission to feel. You see, I've given some variant of this talk all across North America. And without fail, men come up to me afterwards, and it seems that there's a universal truth. Men everywhere are literally dying for people, for someone, to give them permission to feel. The way we think about strong is wrong. For over two decades, I've studied the impact that emotion has on human behavior and the decisions we make. As a business leader and sales professional, I've studied the likes of Dr. Antonio Damasio, Dan Goleman, Dr. Travis Bradbury, and Brene Brown, just to name a few. As a business leader, it became evident that staff productivity and the decisions they made were directly linked to emotion. In my sales career, it was obvious early that my customers bought on emotion justified by logic. So I worked hard to build emotional connection with my customers through the power of story. My intent is to do the same here with you today. So let me tell you a story. My girlfriend Colleen likes to tease me about how badass I am. As a business leader, an Ironman, an ultramarathoner, a rock climber, an ice climber, a yogi, she would tease me often. But I want to let you in on a little secret. Now, you have to promise me that this will not leave this room. This is just between you and I. I'm not really that much of a badass. As a guy that's always been more geek than jock, more nerd than cool kid, I have to admit, it makes my heart swell with pride when she teases me like that. In August of 2015, Colleen and I took a road trip to British Columbia, where I was competing in the Challenge Penticton, an iron, distant, an iron distance triathlon. We got to Penticton, and my Aunt Sharon, who lived in Penticton, came out to cheer. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Aunt Sharon. I want to paint a bit of a picture for you before we carry on. Aunt Sharon's a 65-year-old feisty woman who has babysat me since I was a toddler. Aunt Sharon is not overly fit, not overly active. You might even say she's a little bit overweight. We ended up back at Sharon's place for dinner after the race that night. We got to her place, she set up dinner, and she started telling us this story. She said, you know, Earlier this year, I decided that I wanted to get a little bit more active. I wanted to get a little bit more fit. So as a result, I decided to sign up for the 5K fun run leading up to the Challenge Penticton. She says, you know what? I knew full well I was going to be dead last, but I didn't care. I just wanted to get out and get active. She says, so come race day, I started way at the back of the pack. The gun went off, and off we went. And we get about a kilometer away from the finish line, and she says, all of a sudden, this kid on a bike starts riding beside me. She says, so I looked over, and I said, you're here because I'm last, aren't you? And he says, yep, I'm afraid so. But you're doing great. You're doing great. And he encourages her in. He cheers her in. He rides with her. They're about a couple hundred meters from the finish line. And he says to her, he says, okay, I'm going to ride ahead and let him know you're still out on course. And she says, oh, no, 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 don't do that. And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he takes off. He gets to the end. She looks up and she can see that she is so far last that they've already started tearing down the finish line. They've already started packing up the PA system. Well, the kid on the bike gets to the finish line and tells him she's still out on course. They set up the finish line again. 
They reset up the PA system. Not only do they set everything back up, but they send Jeff Simons out to run across the finish line with her. And if you don't know who Jeff Simons is, Jeff Simons is a professional triathlete. I think he won the 2017 Melbourne Ironman. So he's a badass triathlete. He's a local Okanagan boy, a Penticton hometown hero. So they send him out to run across the finish line with her. There's Sharon. So she finishes telling us the story. We wrap up dinner. She gets up, she clears the table and goes into the kitchen. And Colleen just looks at me and she says, you know what, Mike? She goes, now that's freaking badass. And the whole 10 and a half hour drive on the way home from Penticton, Colleen and I talked about what does it really mean to be a badass? We just so happened to have the Tim Ferriss podcast playing on the, on the stereo. And Tim was interviewing one of my favorite researchers, a lady by the name of Dr. Brene Brown, who you may be familiar with. And at some point in the interview, Tim asked her something to the effect of, what do you think of the over-feminization of boys in our school system? And I kind of went, huh, that caught my attention. Interesting question. But Brene handled it brilliantly. She said, first off, I don't believe that masculine and feminine are mutually exclusive. And she said, secondly, and this is what brought it all together for me. She said, secondly, I believe that that perfect combination of tough and tender is the exact equation for badassery. Boom. There it was. A real badass is not afraid to be vulnerable like my Aunt Sharon. I mean, let me ask you this. How many of you would have the courage to compete in a race that you knew full well you were going to finish dead last? Probably not a lot of us. And if you've followed any of Brene's work, you know she talks about the fact that vulnerability is the core of all emotions. A real badass is not afraid to feel. We make decisions based on emotion. The research backs this up. If we don't understand the underlying emotions that drive the decisions we make, we have zero chance of living a fully awakened existence. Little did I know how much of an impact this concept would come to have on me just a short month later. Little did I know that, in fact, this concept would change my life forever. On October 2nd, 2015, Colleen woke up at my place at 5 a.m. to get ready to go teach yoga at 6, like she often did. She got up, she got dressed, came around to my side of the bed, gave me a kiss, said goodbye, I rolled over, went back to sleep, because that's what you do at 5 o'clock in the morning. I got up around 6.30, quarter to 7, went down, made myself some breakfast, and about 10 after 7, as was our custom, I shot her a text, and I said, good morning. No response. Not a big deal. Well, Colleen's not a huge talker. She's an incredible listener and as a result, often got engaged into long, drawn-out conversations with her students after class. She also had five kids. Who knows, maybe one of them took up some time. So I carried on about my morning. I had a nine o'clock appointment downtown Edmonton. About 8.15, I still hadn't heard from her, so I shot her another text. Good morning, how was yoga? No response. I hopped in the car, drove downtown, tried phoning. Phone rang and rang and rang and rang and rang and rang and eventually kicked the voicemail. I got to my 9 o'clock, went in, came out at 10, still no text, no return call. Now I'm starting to get a little bit worried because this is definitely out of character. You know that feeling you get in the pit of your stomach when something's just not sitting right? So I hopped in the car, I drove back to the office, we're at an 11 o'clock. Tried calling her again, phone rang and rang and rang, voicemail, no answer, no response, no text. Got to the office, got set up, went into my 11 o'clock, shot her another text, hey, let me know you're all right, I'm starting to get a little bit worried about you. And again, that feeling's starting to bubble up a little bit. 
finished my appointment. We had a great meeting. We decided we were going to go across the street together and have lunch. We walked across the street to Vicky's restaurant where Hostess was about to seat us, and my phone rang. And I looked at it, and it was a blocked number. So I answered it. The voice on the other end of the line said, is this Mike Cameron? I said, yes. He says, this is Constable so-and-so. I don't remember his name, and my heart just sank. I said, is she OK? He says, where are you? I said, is she OK? He says, where are you? I said, is she OK? He says, where are you? We're at your house. We're coming to you. So I told him where I was. I turned and I walked out of the restaurant. I don't think I said two words to my guests. I stood at the curb. And about five minutes later, an unmarked police car pulled up across the street. I started crossing, walking across to, to meet him. This big, badass, burly cop with a gun on his side and a badge around his neck hops out of this unmarked police car, meets me halfway across the street. And after identifying who I was, he looked me in the eye and he said three words that would change my life forever. Colleen is dead, shot and killed by an ex-boyfriend who subsequently took his own life. We make decisions based on emotion. The research backs this up. Paul Joseph Jacob, the man that killed Colleen, made a decision based on emotion. He made a decision with very permanent consequences based on a very temporary emotion. When Colleen was killed, everyone wanted me to go after the justice system that surely failed her. After all, she'd done all the right things. She'd filed all the right forms, submitted all the right paperwork, had the right restraining order. But to me, it seemed that working towards building a better restraining order was akin to putting a Band-Aid on a ruptured jugular. To me, it made much more sense to try and look at how do we prevent men like this from existing in the first place. From the time that we're in diapers, we're taught to be strong, to man up, to not be a wuss. And when Colleen was killed, I had many well-meaning friends surround me, hug me, pat me on the back, and hold me, and tell me to be strong. But you know what? I didn't want to be strong. I wanted to curl up into a little ball, and I wanted to cry like a little baby. Strength isn't and. While I love them for their intention, I'm saddened by their ignorance. You see, strength isn't about suppressing, avoiding, or remaining stoic in the face of our emotions. True strength is about having the courage to face our emotions head on, sit with them, observe them, and learn from them what we can. Colleen and I used to talk a lot of philosophy. And I'll never forget, one day we were talking about the concept of talent. And I asked her, what do you think your talent is? And she replied easily, I make things beautiful, which she absolutely did. You see, she was an artist, a painter, a photographer, a videographer, a sculptor, a potter. She had an incredible knack for finding the beauty in everything. She then looked at me and turned the question around. She said, what do you think your talent is? And I kind of hummed and hawed, and I said, you know, not to take away, because by all sort of standard measures, I've been successful. But I'm not sure that there's any particular one thing that I'm exceptionally gifted at or especially talented at. So I said, what do you think my talent is? She said, oh, that's easy. You've got a much more useful talent. I said, oh, what's that? She says, yeah, you make shit happen. Kind of went, huh, as a business guy, I kind of like that. So there you had it. She made things beautiful. I made shit happen.
together we were going to make beautiful shit happen. <laughs> I vowed that day on her driveway that her story would not end there. I vowed that I would continue to do my best to make beautiful shit happen in her name. So my ask of you today is to help me redefine what it means to be a badass in today's society. My ask of you today is to give the men in your life, your father, your brother, your son, your partner, permission to feel. My ask of you today is to feel more, feel more often. My ask of you today is to find your feelings, be badass, and make beautiful shit happen. Thank you.